well, thank you. Thank you for raising the expectations. I mean, first of all, <laughs> thank you, Stefania, for raising the expectations by start having a great speech. And uh, I think everybody's awake. And um, so that's that's more pressure on me. Now you can knock them down. I warm them up that, for you. That was weird. That was, <laughs> that was, that was the deal. Yeah, I'll see if I can keep my side of the bargain. Well, I mean, you heard more about me than I probably would have said myself um, in, in this intro. Um, as, I, like, yeah, as Sam said, I uh, used to be a product manager at, um, at, at Facebook, or Meta, however we want to call it, uh, and at Google, uh, working on like security identity space, um, did a bit of both from like protecting people from highly targeted attacks. Uh, and also protecting people from random spray and prey attacks that uh, they, they, they they could be exposed of. Um, represented Facebook on the board of the Fire Alliance for a while, and now since October 7th or so, um, like I decided to try something else, um, leave corporate life for at least a little bit, and and then see if what I have and what I know and what I think is. is there's a market out there and people who want to talk to me about passwords and similar things. Um, who likes passwords? <laughs> That's okay. It's your own right. So maybe quick agenda. Um, what do we go through here today? It's like, yeah, we'll talk about passwords. Why are passwords? When were passwords good? Why are passwords bad today? Uh, we'll talk about what a passkey is or what passkey is, how does it work, what is the experience, but the potential, because nothing is a silver bullet. Like if there's anything that hopefully everybody reminds themselves every day in security that nothing, whatever the vendor tells you, whatever the standard promises, nothing is a silver bullet. You're not, never going to solve all security issues. So we're not going to run out of work uh, just because of next release of whatever your vendor sells you, but also the same thing for Pasky. It's not going to put us out of work because of limitations and <coughs> attackers. So when, when were passwords OK? Uh, passwords were OK at some point. Um, maybe some of you remember that at some point there were terminals standing in office buildings or in only few office buildings. And back then, those terminals were there to people to access some, some applications to enter data. And the password there was good to define, to make sure that Jane and, and Bob can't access each other's terminal. So the password was only there for the two of them, because they already had a, a badge to enter the building. They had access to the floor that had limited restri had restrictions on who could get into that floor. And they had access to that room. So the password at that point was like the third or fourth factor. Um, to then access the access that terminal. Um, both of them only had one password to remember. Uh, and their attack surface which was much smaller. So for Jane, the attack surface was Bob trying to get into her terminal and vice versa. Um, so that, that has changed. Uh, and since then, passwords are not good enough anymore. And they're getting worse and worse. And I think we're holding on onto something that just doesn't work for us anymore. And it doesn't work for us in two different areas. I mean, we talk here about security. Everybody's thinking about security a lot here um, and probably can come up with 20 reasons why passwords are not great for, for security or why passwords are ter terrible for security. But they're also not great for access. So in addition to that passwords just don't protect us well, they're also not great for, for giving us and people access to, to services because there's a lot of friction on it. And another thing that makes them almost even worse, they depend on the user's ability and motivation to, to make good decisions on what password to use to manage those passwords and, and be aware at every time they click, every time they enter the password, to think about, is this the place I should enter my password or not? Um, I want to continue the tradition of today of, of mentioning books. So if you're interested in a book that I find very inspiring in terms of security, there's a book from this 1965 called Unsafe at Any Speed. And it describes how the car industry had to implement <coughs> security measures because they didn't get away anymore with assuming that people know how to safely operate and safely assemble and maintain the car themselves. Um, so the car industry has gone through that, and I think we as an industry will also have to go through that. 
at the moment there's, the, there's a burden of making sure that people are secure is, is mainly on the people, on the users themselves. They have to decide which passwords to use. They have to decide if they can click on a link or not. Um, and we're relying on, we're relying on them to, to make those decisions. And I think passwords are, are a crucial element to that, that where, where it's really failing us. So if we're looking at problems with passwords, and I think I'm preaching to people here who, who are thinking about this in a similar way, probably, probably no, no surprises. I will, yes. Then I'll uh, move on. Um, well, first of all, we don't make great decisions in managing our passwords. Uh, we use passwords that are that are guessable because we like to remember them. Sometimes we try to be smart and, and replace an A with a four or a dollar a S with a dollar sign. But if 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 that helps us remember the password, it probably also helps the attacker remember it. Passwords can get fished. Like the password really doesn't care in which form it's getting typed into. It, it, I can type it into. Google.com to log in into my Gmail account, or I can type in into badpeople.com, and it doesn't resist. It lets itself type in into wherever. So that makes it really easy for, for phishing attack to succeed, for phishing attacks to, to perform well. And at that point, it really doesn't matter if my password was easy guessable, or it was the longest, most complicated password that any password manager has ever generated. If it's phished, it's phished, and it's out. <coughs> And then we reuse those passwords. I mean, like if any one of here, if any of you tells me that they never reuse the password, then either you're Bob or Jane that only has one password for your terminal, or, or, you, or you're just not very honest, or you're a genius and great, and maybe then, then you deserve all the respect in the world. Like even with password managers, it's probably not that easy to not or never reuse passwords. And, and pa bad actors can spell. Like, we're still an industry that tell people, be aware of emails that are spelling mistakes because those emails are, are phishing emails. I, I find if your defense relies on your employees and, and your family members to detect spelling mistakes in, uh, in emails, you're on very thin ice. <laughs> if your defense is based on attackers not being able to spell or not able to use a, a spell correction tool, you're also on very thin ice. Problems with passwords are very common. I, I won't read these statistics here, but that everybody's affected. Everybody makes the same mistakes, so passwords are, are, are really not doing a good job or a, a, an adequate job at protecting us. Now, the problem we maybe think a little bit less about is access. Um, passwords are not just easy to get us in trouble with, but they're also, they're also quite hard to use. People really struggle to manage their passwords. Like every time I watch, I look at uh, my, my mother when she has to sign up somewhere, there is a, an elevated level of stress when it, the service asks her, now come up with a password. And that, that, is, that is hard for a lot of people because now they have to come up with something they can remember, something that they feel is reasonable. Um, again, password one, two, three, four, five might not be that. Even though I was able to set up a new LinkedIn, a new Twitter account a few weeks ago, using password one two three four five, uh, password one two three four was not was not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can do better. Password one two three four five was okay, and now we can be cynics about it and say, oh well, they should also block one password one two three four five. But at some point, it gets too hard for people to remember them. It gets too hard for people to come up with them, and then they fall back to something maybe even more ridiculous, their phone number with their name in behind. And, and then they lose, and they lose effect. And also they lose, um, thank you. And also that the people are not able to, to use them anymore. Like I, I, I wonder how the relying part, people who work at relying parties here see, see those numbers, but there's a lot of people who, when they change devices, they lose access to a lot of their previous accounts because they just don't remember those passwords. So it's not just a security issue that I think we all agree, passwords are bad, passwords are not secure, 
but it's also an access issue. So it prevents a lot of people from continuously being able to access their, their services. Um, it can be a growth hinderer, like you have acquired the customer and now you lose them because they have forgotten their password. So it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of work for people <coughs> to, keep, to maintain them and still doesn't put them into a, into a really good sustainable security baseline. Passwordless. Um, I think I just added this slide a little bit more for terminology than for anything else, because at the moment everybody talks about passwordless. Passwordless for enterprise, passwordless for consumers, passwordless with mobile authentication methods, passwordless in any, any other way. What, what people then forget, it's the nuance behind it. I think I differentiate between passwordless login, as in being able to log in into a new account, on an account that where you have a password with an alternative. The attacker, in that case, will still try to use the password. They will go through the lower, less frictionful, the cheaper way to attack the account. If you really want to tackle the problem, we'll have to move towards accounts that are passwordless. So that means accounts that don't have a password, a knowledge factor that people can, can, can get on hold of, that the attacker can fall back and, and fish and guess or, or get leaked from a, from a credential dumps and benefit from, you, from us reusing them. So when next time some, again, some vendor or somebody talks to you about passwordless, uh, ask them really, is this going to leave me with passwordless accounts or is it quote unquote just a passwordless login alternative that will reduce friction? Yes, but is not significantly going to improve the security, the security posture. So we've been talking about passwords and why they're bad in terms of access and in terms of security. And I promised to talk about passkey. So <coughs> Let, let's go a bit into that and, um, and see how that works. So what is passkey? For, for people who have known um, FIDO or, or platform authenticators before, which this, it's usually the thing that the banking app asks you to create after you log in with a username or a password to then say, do you want to use fi Face ID in the future to log in onto your account on that set device? That's basically what passkey does across different devices. So. <coughs> Um, these banking apps that I mentioned, what they usually, what they would do, they create a set of cryptographic encrypted credentials on your local device that in allow you to, instead of using a password, to log in again after you close the app and start it again, or you come back after two days, five days, ten days, to, 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 use, uh, to, to use your face ID, a local biometric, to unlock the, the vault or the keychain in which it is, and then authenticate with that. So what's, what's new with Passkey is that now the standard, the web of <coughs> standards, standard and the FIDO standards allow platforms to, to, to synchronize these credentials across different devices. So once you create one of those credentials that authenticates that you are the one that is allowed to bypass the password step, that you can also do that on a, on a different step, uh, on a different device. So it will, for the first time, make it possible to use that local verification step to bypass the password, not just on the device you have set up now, but also on future devices. So let, let, let's walk through a bit. That sounds maybe sounds cryptic, because cryptography. Uh, that was not not a pun intended. Um, <laughs> but let's walk a bit through the through the experience. How will a person or a user experience this? So. I'm a, I used to be a product manager. I'm not a product designer. So these are not, don't even, these are not product designs that anyone should implement. I'm also not a content designer or a UX writer. So I have been kept keeping it simplistic for to show the mental model and the structure, but don't, don't think that you should use that language to talk to, to explain to people how to use it. So the path key experience starts with you're logged in on, a ser on, your, on your app or on a website. And the, the service would offer you the opportunity to create a passkey or to create a <coughs> set of credentials that allow you to bypass the password in the future um, on, your, on your device. So in this case, I'm using a lot of iPhone and iCloud and Apple terminology, but the same mechanisms will also work on different platforms as, as they roll out passkey functionality. And we can go into that a little bit later. So 
you would start with prompting the user, hey, Jennifer, do you want to create a passkey? Passkey will allow you to bypass the password step in the future and offer you a more secure login. The user would say yes. They will go through, in the case of, of a mod, more modern iPhone, they will go through a, a face ID check. The credentials will be stored locally and on the iCloud keychain, and, and that will be it. So on the keychain, there's now an entry that contains that, that passkey associated with the account for the service that it's associated with. Now, Jennifer loses her phone, drops it in the ocean, um, it never goes and buys a new one, buys a new device from the same, same ecosystem, uses the same iCloud account, installs the app, and then the app discovers there is a FIDO credential stored for this service on that keychain. So it will ask, do you want to use that one? or do you want to log in with a, with a separate set of credentials? She says yes, and then Pat goes through the face ID check, and then the login is successful. So what, what, what you might think now is, oh, well, this is a, just, it uses biometrics to, to log in into the account, but the biometrics are not synchronized across the cloud in this case. So in this case, it's, the biometrics are really just there to open up, to authenticate towards the, the keychain extract the credentials, use them, throw them at the WebAuthn API, very technical term, how I use it, see, uh, and, and, and authenticate it as a service. So in this step, Jennifer didn't have to use a password anymore, which she probably forgot, which she probably has, maybe has written down somewhere, but doesn't have on hand right now, and, and was, able to, was able to log in. Now, I mentioned before, where is it supported? Um, like something I skipped a bit earlier on. Uh, some apologies for that. This passkey is a is a new standard. It's it's, it's being passed in W3C. It's been proposed just this year by by the FIDO Alliance. So we we don't see much adoption yet, or that much support yet on passkey. But what we have is we have commitment from the three platform vendors, Apple, Microsoft, and Google that have said they are going to support passkey in, within the next couple of months. Apple has started with this with iOS 16 and whatever the current Mac OS version is called uh, and new Safari versions, they, they support it. So if you're moving within the Apple ecosystem, you now have there's some services like, like PayPal and, and eBay and probably a lot of that I haven't seen yet that will give you the opportunity to do that. So if you're moving within, within this ecosystem, you, you'll be able to benefit from those pass keys, from those credentials being synced across the keychain that, that then allow you to log in passwordless in a, within, uh, with your, w within your devices, with new devices. Google is, has announced that they're probably going to launch something end of this year, early next year. But this year is almost over, so I, I wouldn't hold my breath for 2022. Microsoft, I, I have not seen more concrete things, but somewhere in H1 next year, they're going to support it. Um, so we spoke about why passwords are bad for security. Oh, I have to go closer. <laughs> we, we spoke about why they're bad for access. So how, how can pass keys improve, improve security? Um, so whenever you have a login that is based on a passkey instead of a password, you have the assurance as the relying party that this login doesn't include anything that can be that the bad actor was able to guess. So you're not going to be, you know that that login is not just a login attempt is not just a, a sophisticated password spray or semi-sophisticated password spray attempt. It couldn't be fished because you don't have a knowledge factor that can be fished or intercepted by, by some man-in-the-middle type of attack. It also can't be reused because it's a, it's a uniquely set of credentials that is created for each, for each account, for each relying party um, in, in, a com in combination of that. So they, they really de deterministically reduce a lot of the attack vectors that we have discussed before make passwords such a bad authentication method. They're not just 
<coughs> reducing the risk or make those attacks harder, but they make those attacks impossible. You're not spraying anything anymore, you're not phishing anymore, you're really having a login that you can trust that the account holder or the person who has issued that login attempt has access to a certain set of of, of credentials it means that they have been successfully being able to access the iCloud keychain or Google Sync keychain or whatever the equivalent of that is on the in the Microsoft world. And it also reduces the, the user's responsibility to make good choices. So I think we, we spoke about it before, like passwords may re require people to make good choices. Sometimes you get away with password one, two, three, four, five, but sometimes you don't. But in this case, you, you don't have to make good choices. You, you, you rely on the cryptographic abilities of, of, this, of the platform to, to create safe or good enough credentials. How can it reduce churn? So we spoke about access being a big issue. When people abandon their old devices, they lose access to their, to their accounts because they forgot what, what passwords they used before one, two, three, four years when they, when they set up that device for the first time. Um, they, they often lose access to their, maybe their .edu email address that they got when they, when they were at uni, and now they don't have access anymore, so they can't reset the password of their account. They have forgotten the password too. So passkey helps you there. It, it reduces or it eliminates the need for people to remember something. There's, there's a bit of an asterisk, as long as they remember the access to their platform account, like the iCloud or the Google account. But it, it really doesn't require them to remember a, a password for every, every type of uh, service they use. It doesn't require dedicated hardware or software. Like It doesn't require them to install uh, an authenticator app for which they probably lose the seed key and then have lose access to it once they abandon their device. It doesn't require them to buy a security key um, to, to go through as, as they had to do with other FIDO standards. So it, it works with what they already have. And it makes those credentials across available across different websites and apps and surfaces and devices. So one of the access problems that I described before is, is not just people who switch devices and lose access to it, but a lot of the people in the consumer world, and especially outside of our part of the world where people have older devices, they often suffer from lack of, lack of um, storage space. So they end up deleting applications they don't need that, that day or then that week and then reinstalling them later again. This allows them to keep a persistent login and session across the life cycle of those apps. So they don't have to go and log in every time again they reinstall the Twitter app or their banking app or the app that they use to, I don't know, to file tax returns um, once a year or, or even fewer times. So I'm just stopping because I thought that slide should have come before, but I just moved it. Um, so. We now, you now have seen how people log in with, within, their, within their ecosystem using passkey. So if I lose my old iPhone, I buy a new iPhone, that pass is relatively straightforward. Install the app, discovers that, I'm, that I have some discoverable credentials that can be used on that new de device, log in, bypass the password, password step. Now, because the synchronization of these pass keys happens within the ecosystem of, of the platform provider at, at this point. It might change in the future. The, the problem is, is then, well, how do I log in on a Windows computer if I have an iPhone? Or how do I log in on a, on a Chromebook if I have an iOS device or, or, or vice versa? So what Apple has launched and, and what Google will launch and, and Microsoft as well, they have demoed those things, is, is cross-platform login with Passkey. So what, how, that, how that works is they will establish a, a local connection between the different devices. So in this case, Jennifer starts the, the, her app again and there is no Passkey. There is no set of credential on that, on, on that device that can be used to log in by pass, without the password. But this, the app supports it and asks, 
hey, do you want to use a different device to log in into that, into that app? So in this case, Jennifer has an iPhone. She takes a picture of the QR code. What the QR code does, does it's establishing a Bluetooth or a BLE connection between the device that's already logged in, the one that has the pass key, and the device where she's trying to log in onto. And then exchanges the information, she passes, she has to go through Face ID, if it's an iPhone, fingerprint, or whatever, it's, if it's a different device, and then establishes a session on that new device. Well, now I, you would think, why does it have to be a Bluetooth connection? Bluetooth is difficult and hard and, and, and adds friction and causes problem. The reason is that having a, a connection that connects through some centralized server and then back, which then could be fall, could put the, could Jennifer in this case, put at risk of being, being at risk for phishing, you, you need a local connection. And then that's what the Bluetooth connection does. It ensures that the person who's authenticating and the, pers and the surface they want to authenticate to is, is being rendered in a device on the same location and not one is badpeople.com that runs some evil jinx um, proxy in, in their data center and then forwards everything to the proper site and, and the other one is, is, uh, is, is what the user has in hand. So it solves the phishing problem in, in a similar way that FIDO security keys solve the phishing problem. It solves the phishing problem in a similar way or in the same way that pass keys um, solve the problem by really requiring a local user interaction between the relying party they're logging into and, and the user that, that is authenticating <coughs> in real time. Now, how do you get passkey out there? Um, I think, this, as I said before, there's, there's a couple of limitations and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a few more of them a bit later. But like with every other thing, like with every other change, it, it requires companies to make an investment in, in changing from what has worked good enough under the, at the bottom line maybe so far to, to support something new. But we have the limitation that not every device supports passkey yet. Uh, not every user has, has the capability to authenticate <coughs> on all of their devices with passkey. So I think there's a sensible four-phase or n-phase rollout that could be done that makes sense and delivers some value for your business right now and then allows you to build on top of that over time. So phase number one, let's do an opportunistic rollout. At this point, as of... November 17th, it's probably up 25 to 30 percent of iOS users, um, probably eight or 10 percent of macOS users um, that that can use Passkey <coughs> on their on their current device. So it's a very it's a relatively small number of people. But if you can get these people enrolled in <coughs> creating a Passkey, get them to use it on the next login, you're certainly going to see a reduction in churn. These people won't have to rely on their memory or their superhuman ability to manage passwords um, to, to log in again on the next device. They will be just be able to use, use it uh, right away. And you're starting to get a certain number of logins in which you can trust more than, than in the others. At that point, you still have passwords. Like The attackers will still try to get those passwords. That's not going to change, but at least you will have some, some number of logins that have gone through with lower friction, and you can go to your growth team, you can go to your marketing team, whoever cares most about retention, and then show them that, you have, that the investment you have made has an immediate business value for, for you, as in re increasing ret retention. Second step, you can then start to stop or trust passwords even less than you did before. Now, you, you have a certain number of people who, are, who have a passkey, who are able and have demonstrated that they're able to, to log in with a password alternative once they buy a new device. A certain number of people who have shown that they're moving horizontally within their ecosystem, like they're, they're moving within their, the Apple, the Google, the Microsoft ecosystem. So those are accounts that if you see a password-based login coming from them, 
you could start to be much more suspicious. You could either tweak your risk engine to trust that to add relative risk to every login that is based on password from a user that has been has proven to be able to use passkey, or you could add deterministic speed bumps in every passkey password login that could also be a passkey login. So that is the that is the first situa first moment where you're raising the security bar because you have some people who could use the more secure way, but for some reason you see a password-based login, and because they have shown they be able to use passkey, you could just say I'm. I just don't trust those password logins as much anymore because that is that is more likely to be an attacker, a bad actor, than than it is to be the good actor. So the impact there is really you, you make password compromise harder. You make them more expensive and you force the attacker to move horizontally within whatever audience of, of victims that they're they're going for and, and trying to find other people who are still where passwords are still the primary and preferred method of authentication. Once you have that, you can start to be more adventurous. Uh, you can start to remove password as an option for signups. If, if somebody signs up on a device that supports passkey, that has the ability to create these credentials and synchronize them across, across a cloud-based keychain, there's no reason for you to give them access to the password anymore or to force them to create the password. So that solves my mother's fear that every time when she's being asked for a password, her, her heart rate just goes up by, by 50 or 60 until she, she remembers that she could just use one of her old passwords with, some, with a lot of variation and write it down on a post-it, and then she calms down again. So you solve that, that point of friction. And <coughs> you're going to have passwordless accounts. You're going to have accounts that for the first time don't even have a password. And that means they have a completely dis different, or they have a significantly different risk profile. Like those accounts, you don't have to worry about them getting password sprayed. You don't have to worry about those people getting phished. Um, the only thing you probably have to, one of the things you probably have to get worried about is that they get tricked into creating a password if they have that ability that then gets phished. But that's significantly more expensive than trying password one, two, three, four, five on a Twitter account that I created six weeks ago. And maybe some of you have already found. Um, I, I'll, I can give you an Amazon gift card if you find it. Um, so um, let me know after, this, after the presentation or tomorrow or, or in a week. Um, I, I want, uh, by the way, I wanted to make the Amazon gift card joke already before. Some people have traded in passwords for Amazon gift cards. <laughs> that is also quite a popular thing to do. Um, if you have 2FA, maybe that's a good thing to do. You can just, an easy way to get gift cards. But sign up on the website there. Um, that's an e even easier way to get one. So phase three is we're removing passwords for sign up. We're, we're ramping up numbers of, of accounts that, have, that don't even have a password which makes it harder for attackers. They will have to invest more time in finding accounts that are still still vulnerable. And then phase N, the end goal, let's get rid of passwords. But let's be clear, this, this is going to be a long, a long phase. This is not going to be somebody, something most relying parties are going to do within the next year or two or three, because the implications on potential growth, the, the implications on the reliance on your recovery process is, is going to be significant. But it is, a, it, is a, it is a goal to which you can work towards to, because now you have a, an ability to authenticate without the password that lives with the life cycle of, of most users who, who continue to live within their ecosystem. We're going to see different players who are also going to implement passkey, like password managers um, and uh, probably other security companies. So the, the way these past keys synchronize in a, in a secure way across different, different devices will, will probably expand. But if we're concerned about people who use password one, two, three, four, five, we're, those are not, usually not the ones that are using sophisticated password managers anyway. So I think the biggest impact is going to be with people who, who move within their, within their mobile and, and operating ecosystem. So, that there's obviously always a problem. There's always a but. 
or, or more. And it's quite complex. Like, if we're looking at this as a funnel, like I've, I've spoken to marketing and gross people um, about <coughs> Passkey, and they always wanted to see, well, in theory, yes, this is great. You have X number of people who every month, every year, drop out of monthly active users because they have forgotten their passwords. You have a certain number of accounts who go temporarily or permanently dormant because they have forgotten that. But how many of those people can you really get back with Passkey? And I think that's where really you need to talk to your data scientists, um, to, to, to your analytics team, in order to understand what is the opportunity you can have here. That the funnel starts with people who can even create a passkey credential at this point. What did I say before? It's iOS 16 and newest version of macOS, whatever that is, and, and Safari. So it's, it's a relatively small community of people who can create that <coughs> yet, depending how your service is designed, or who your target audience is, you might have more or less um, users who fall into that. Over time, that will go up. So that's something you have no in, impact have no influence on. You, you can't move, you can't convince, or you're unlikely to be able to convince your, your users to upgrade phone um, with, with reasonable effort. So it's just something that will play on over the next couple of years. And then you have to convince <coughs> them to create a passkey. I think that should be a smaller problem because people are already used to allow their apps to use Face ID to log in, repeat, to do continuous user authentication, and th this is the same user flow. But you'll have to explain them why is it better than what they had before, um, why, sh why should they do it now. And so it's a bit of an upsell and a bit of a, um, it's, a it's almost like a feature sales mechanism that you have to go through. So you'll lose, you'll, you'll, your funnel will, will drop off at, at some point. And then you'll go and have people who log in on a new device. And that new device has to be from the same ecosystem. It has to be from using the same platform account. Uh, and those are, those are both things that might be correct for many of us here. But the, the ratio in which people maintain access to their, to their platform accounts is, is, is varies highly depending on the, on the geographies. They have to want to use, continue to use the service. They have to pass the next step. And then only then you'll, you'll see a different a success rate in terms of journal reduction and actual passwordless logins. So now that sounds very negative and pessimistic, but I just wanted to sh walk you through this funnel that is, that is a combination of steps that you as a, a relying party can influence and steps that you as a relying party are not able to influence to, to give, bit, give a bit of a more realistic picture of how much of a slow burner a new standard like passkey could could feel like it being uh, in the next in the next one or two years. So if you came to this presentation hoping that tomorrow you can roll out something that will solve all of your password needs, <coughs> I'm sorry I disappointed you. <laughs> I hope that was the biggest disappointment of my presentation then. Um, <coughs> so another few buts. Um, okay, as I said, passkey support is still quite limited, um, but the commitment of the large vendors is there. So at least over the next couple of months, we will see, we'll see support in, in newer versions of operating system increase, which means makes it more attractive for relying parties to implement it. And, and I think there's, there's an interest, there's a good opportunity for this cycle of adoption to, to be faster than maybe with other passwordless authentication methods we've seen in the four, we've seen before. What Passkey will do, it, it won't just put all these bad actors out. It won't put all these bad actors out of work. Like the ones that today are phishing you and trying to guess passwords and you buy credential dumps to, to spray and to use them at not new other services, they will try something else. And it is probably safe to say that the scrutiny will increase on the platform accounts. So while today it's cheap, very cheap for, for somebody to compromise your username and password-based account by phishing or, or like spraying or, well, password12345 Twitter account is certainly a cheap one for somebody to get. 
it, it will get more expensive and then they will go for the for these underlying platform accounts. Mm -hmm. So get, getting access to somebody's iCloud account, getting access to somebody's Google account or uh, Microsoft.com account um, or Windows, so Microsoft 365 account will, will get more value because it will give them access to those pass keys and make make compromise possible through the login login path. So as a relying party, again, you, you're not going to be able to just dump your risk-based engines in the, in the trash and, and forget everything that you had before, not just because passkey adoption will, will be a slow, slow ramp up, but also because the attack vectors are going to evolve. The issue of recovery is not solved yet. And you're still going to have to offer people the recovery <coughs> flow. And recovery flow is something I sometimes call, it's the cheap login flow. Like it's, it's, it's a backup method for people to log in who have forgotten the thing that you wanted them to do in the first place. So people will still lose access to their iCloud accounts. People will, will lose access to their email addresses. And those things won't go away. So recovery is still going to be a big problem that you need, need, to, be, need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, well. I think, so I think just as a conclusion, I think Passkey, and I, I will be curious on how, how, how your impression is, but Passkey is going to be a good opportunity for us to reduce the reliance we currently have on passwords. Like their passwords are, are, are today omni, omnipresent. Everybody uses them. Every service uses them as, a, as the first line of defense. So we'll be able to reduce our reliance on, on it. But we'll only be able to do it in a relatively slow way, in a, in a, maybe in a, in a way that takes a bit longer than, um, than, than many people have hoped. But because of it being a standard and it being adopted by, in the same way by this, the big platforms, it will be a much more sustainable way to do that than if everybody has to implement their own, their own capabilities and, and their own alternatives. Um, yeah, um, questions. I know we don't have a microphone, so I'll, I'll also repeat the questions. First of all, big thank you.